Copyright, University of South Australia. This recording may contain third-party copyright material. Apart from any use permitted under the Copyright Act 1968, no part of this recording may be reproduced or rebroadcast by any means or process without the prior written permission of the University of South Australia and the copyright owners. Okay, welcome back. Let's have a go at drawing in some of the muscles. So you'll find this on your Moodle page underneath the practicals component of your resources. So print it out and have a look. We spoke about in the lecture that we had three elbow flexors and that each of these is responsible for creating flexion in different positions of pronation and supination. So if we think about those muscles and we write them in, so we had muscles like biceps brachii, then we had brachialis, and we had brachioradialis. So these three muscles are what are responsible for creating flexion around the elbow. Biceps brachii is also a supinator. So it will work primarily in the supinated position. Brachialis, because it attaches to the ulna, will work at all times. And brachioradialis will be most working in the mid-prone, so thumb up position, or the fully pronated position, because it attaches to the radius. So if we're going to put those in, in their approximate positions, let's get a bit closer to have a look at where they come from and go to. So here... Having a look at the biceps brachii. This bony prominence that we can see here on the scapula is the coracoid process. And then if we go up, see that groove there? This is the intertubercular groove, and this is where the tendon of the long head will run up to the glenoid uh, fossa. So here's where the two heads come from, from the coracoid process here, and what we call as the supraglenoid tubercle. So the short head coming like this, and the long head coming like this, they will travel down, and their two muscle bellies will fuse together and insert via the same tendon down here to the radial tuberosity. So we need to draw two distinctly different muscle bellies but then fusing together. This is why we call biceps. Two heads and brachii because on the arm. So here is the short head on the more medial aspect and the long head on the more lateral aspect. So we can see here that because this muscle comes from the scapula and goes to the radius, it will create both flexion about the elbow and flexion about the shoulder. And because it's attached to the radius as well, that's where it gets the action of supination. Brachialis, on the other hand, comes from the mid shaft of the humerus like this, and actually travels down and attaches to the ulna. So it won't be attaching to the radius and attaching to the ulna instead. And because it attaches to the ulna, it will not have any part in pronation or supination, so we'll be working in any position of elbow flexion. Brachioradialis, on the other hand, comes from a crest or a ridge line that we see here in the lateral aspect of the humerus. Now, this supra above the condyle, so supracondylar ridge here, is the origin of brachioradialis. So why brachio? Because it's coming from the arm and radialis because it's going to the radius. So its muscle belly travels down like this and it has a long tendon which then attaches to the styloid of the radius down on its distal end, right down there. Now this is going to be best used in the mid prone position, so with your thumb up like you're saying g'day to a mate, or in the fully pronated position. Now, nerve supply for these muscles, our brachioradialis is by the radial nerve, and then biceps brachii and brachialis are by the musculocutaneous. So both of those are by the musculocutaneous, as said in the previous video. Sorry, musculocutaneous. 
Moving on to the elbow extensors. So elbow extensors, we know that we have the triceps brachy. And this is a nice and easy one, triceps brachy. It's got three heads, triceps brachy. And it has a long head, a short head, and a, a lateral head. So its long head comes from this bony prominence that we can see here, that little projection that we can see. This is called the infraglenoid tubercle. So the long head coming from the infraglenoid tubercle lives most medially and then comes up and is shaped somewhat, oh, sorry, somewhat like this. That line that you can see there, that darker line, this is actually the radial groove that we talked about earlier. Now the radial groove denotes the origin of the attachment for the lateral head. So where we have the radial groove here is where we will find the lateral head of the humerus out there like that. And then its short head comes from deep against the shaft here and we will only see a small part of it here on the medial side. So it can, can be called the medial head or the short head, you can make that decision, um, up to you. But the reason why we've left a gap here in the middle is because these muscles share obviously a common tendon, our triceps tendon, which attaches here to the olecranon. So attaching to the olecranon process this is kind of like your quadriceps tendon where all muscle bellies come in together and attach via that triceps tendon to the olecranon process. So thinking about these three heads here, we can see the medial head or the short head and the lateral head originate from the humerus only, so therefore can only perform action upon the elbow. Whereas because we have the long head here coming from the scapula, it'll also perform extension around the shoulder that we discussed. Uh, later last week. Now the triceps brachii, we know this is on the back, so therefore our nerve is going to be radial nerve. Moving on to the next page, we're going to have a look at the muscles originating nearby the medial and lateral epicondyles of the humerus, so our wrist extensors, fingers ex finger extensors, etc. So wrist extensors now we've got three, and we talked about in the lecture that we know that if they're wrist extensors, they're going to start with the word extensor. So if there's three, we'll write it three times. Then we know that it's the wrist and the bones in the wrist of the carpal bone, so therefore we know the word that's going to be next is carpi. Then two of them are for the radius, so we have radialis, and one for the ulna, so we have ulnaris, and because we have two radialis we need a word after, so we have longus, and we have brevis. Now all of these muscles come from the same spot, about the lateral epicondyle of the humerus that you can see out here. Now how can we always identify that, because we can see the thumb is here, we know that the thumb is the lateral finger, so our lateral epicondyle will therefore be above the radius, finding here. So originating from up there, we're going to put in extensor carpi radialis longus and extensor carpi ulnaris on this picture, and then extensor carpi radialis brevis on this picture because they kind of overlay a little bit. So if we're putting in extensor carpi radialis longus, we take origin from just above the lateral epicondyle region and travel down like this, similar to brachioradialis, but traveling all the way and attaching to the base of the second metacarpal. So now we've crossed the wrist and we're attaching onto the bases of the metacarpal, therefore we'll create action upon the wrist. Extensor carpi ulnaris, coming from the lateral epicondyle here, but we'll pass out toward the ulna side and its tendon will go to the base of the fifth metacarpal. 
Now you don't have to worry about the difference between ulnaris or radialis on this side, whereas on the flexor it's a little bit different like we discussed in the previous video. All of these ones here are going to be innervated by the radial nerve. So from there, let's put in extensor carpi radialis brevis. Once again from the lateral epicondyle here, it's going to travel down. Instead of going to the base of the second, it's going to go through and attach to the base of the third metacarpal. So still on the radial side, but to the third metacarpal instead of the second. So we have extensor carpi radialis brevis, extensor carpi radialis longus, and extensor carpi ulnaris. The finger extensor, this one is lovely and easy. Extensors, we know that the word is going to be extensor. Fingers, we know is digitorum. And that's it. That's as easy as it gets. Coming from the lateral epicondyle once again, a broader muscle belly will travel down the forearm on its posterior aspect. And then, once it passes underneath the extensor retinaculum, it will travel and go into four individual tendons to attach to the posterior aspect of the hand, of the fingers, sorry, and therefore extend the fingers. We'll talk about how this specific insertion occurs a little bit later um, and in the lecture this week. Thumb extensors, we have two. We have extensor, once again, But because it's for the thumb, we don't have carpi, we don't have digitorum, we have pollicis. And because there's two of them, we need a longus and a brevis. So extensor carpi radia, uh, sorry, extensor pollicis longus and extensor pollicis brevis, these muscles come from the ulna and the radius respectively. So putting these two guys in here, Extensor carpi, extensor pollicis longus, sorry, will come from about the midpoint of the ulna shaft and it will pass along like this, forming one of the borders to the snuff box, attaching all the way to the distal phalange of the thumb. So this is something that's commonly asked as a question is, name a muscle which attaches to the distal phalange of the thumb. And there would be two. If you can imagine, so attaching to the anterior side of the distal phalange of the thumb will be flexor pollicis longus, and attaching to the posterior side will be extensor pollicis longus. But to put in extensor pollicis brevis, this one comes from the radius instead, all right, forming another border to the snuff box, and attaching instead now not to the uh, distal phalange, but to the proximal. So you can see there there's a little potential gap that's left, forming those borders of the snuff box that we talked about before. And we said here this was extensor pollicis longus and this one has extensor pollicis brevis. If we talk about the one abductor of the thumb which you would find in the posterior aspect here, we would be finding not extensor but abductor because that's its action, pollicis longus and you're wondering why is this one longus when there's no brevis in this side and that's because we'll find the brevis in the thenar muscle group that we uh, started to talk about earlier now because it's another longus it will come from the ulna so it comes from slightly higher above along the ulna shaft it will pass along and because it's an abductor it won't attach to the phalanges if it attaches to the phalanges it will create extension but because it goes to the base of the metacarpal it will create abduction of the thumb at the carpo-metacarpal joint. So this one here is abductor pollicis longus. Let's just remember again though that all of these extensors and abductors are by the radial nerve. If we move on to the wrist flexors, uh, we'll do that in a, another video.